Okay, um, I think we're just going to start. Um, thank you all for coming to the open jury of term one. Um, it's an interesting open jury because it sits within the AAXX 100 conference, so which is one of the events we're doing to celebrate the centenary of women being admitted to the AA. Um, the audience here is a mix of people who are full-time students of staff at the AA and then people who've been attending the conference, so I'm trying to manage both at the moment. Um, but basically the reason we, um, we themed the open jury on beauty was because it came out of a conversation that actually Melody, who's one of our jurors, organized this summer at the Ace Hotel. And one of the panels, which I was a part of, was looking at this idea of beauty and why it's been so overlooked or forgotten as a kind of discourse within architecture. And the conversation was really interesting and stimulated a lot of discussion. And I thought this could be a nice continuation of that in terms of how a range of student projects from every kind of part of the school are addressing it in different ways. So each student will speak a bit about how that relates to their projects. Um, all the projects are from the past academic year, so from 2016-17. Um, and there's going to be six students presenting today. And um, we've invited a panel of six jurors, but of course everyone in the audience, I encourage you to participate and ask them questions about their projects. Um, so just to briefly introduce the jurors, um, starting from the edge there, uh, Helen Solve is an AA graduate and she also works at Doug and Morris Architects and she's been involved in the AAXX project for many years. Um, Jane Duncan is the immediate past president of the RIBA and she runs her own architectural practice. Uh, Ava Jurikna, uh, past council president and longtime friend of the AA, she designed the exhibition for the AAXX 100 project, which I encourage you all to look at if you haven't already. Melody Lung from um, Zaha Hadid Architects, who, as I mentioned, organized this amazing conference, which is actually all female participants um, in the summer at the Ace Hotel as part of the um, I guess like a part of the architecture festival, and then Monia Demarkey, head of first year, and then in the corner, uh, Samantha Hardingham, our interim director of the AA, who will join the table. And, um, and then to briefly introduce who will be presenting, um, we're going to start off with Yasmina, who's going to present a book. That's why there's this film set up, because we have to be able to see it in detail. And so she was in Diploma Unit 9 last year. Um, she's going to be followed by James, who is going to present one of the many projects he did last year as first year. Um, and he's going to talk about his project in Marfa. Uh, following that, we're going to have Gilly presenting her dissertation through the History and Critical Thinking MA. And then we'll have uh, Zineb from Intermediate 12, uh, looking at how um, beauty manifests in the landscape. And uh, after that, we're going to have Talia talking about not her project in Projective Cities, but an exhibition she staged in the back members room last year about the use of gold in Trump's interiors. And then we're going to end with Josh from Diploma 4, who's going to present this fascinating object on the wall that's a mixture of fur and LED. So please join me in welcoming them all to present. Hello, uh, I'm Yasmina. I'm a fifth year student and I'm going to present my project of last year, uh, which is called the Black Hole Library. Um, architecture is about the, the juxtaposition of events through time, space, scale, and narrative. Architects design with, uh, with established norms, regulation, and knowledge, but our design process consists of ideas that travel, jump, pop in your head to sometimes stare or disappear, acting like black holes, constantly destroying and recreating ideologies. But what if we start thinking further about the connection and collapse of these independent elements which are time, space, scale, and narrative? The Black Hole Library is an apparatus of infinite stories uh, by juxtaposing them through seemingly unrelated events. And now I want to invite you to enter the library, but please note that uh, the story is not the, the narrative is not the story of the project. This is not a black hole. It's Lisette's morning coffee that she has at the regular cafe place across the shore. Well, and it's 
Lisette decides to have a calm and nice day on the beach. She walks and isolates herself underneath the lighthouse, sucked in her book while listening to the peaceful sound of the waves. She spends all her day there until sunset, emptying her mind and thoughts. She then goes home, has a nice bath, and perfumes herself. You can see on that. While Lisette is having a calm and nice bath at that exact point in time in Egypt, not too far from the first stepped pyramid of Djoser, a shot is fired and an innocent man dies underneath the full moon. After her calm bath, Lisette goes to the kitchen and cooks dinner for her and Sammy to have that night. They get interrupted by a phone call from the investigation office. A man has been shot on the staircases of the National Theatre School in the middle of a show on a cosmic crime. Lisette and Sammy, being very well-reputed detective, rush to the crime scene located in the National Theatre School where the investigation starts. They track down the assassin's path, they go to his flat, start opening up all the covers, trying to look for more clues, until they find his library, and they collect all of his books to gather the information and build up the case. But little did they know, the assassin is always a step ahead. With the help of his accomplice, he completely destroys the corpse's evidences. Here you can see the ashes dumped in the Panka jungle. She also helps him transform some of these ashes into diamonds. After five years spent on the case with no evid evidences to be found, Lisette and Sammy got, start getting sucked into an unsolvable case that starts growing. While this case grows, their memory grows with it and they start losing, losing its its importance and relevance. Now this case is part of this book. And this book starts growing. It keeps growing more and more and more, sucking more information into a funnel until it crosses its event horizon, reaches singularity, the point of no return. Oops, sorry. 15 years have passed. Where is it? <laughs> and this is still not a black hole, it's an element that stops time. And it's also Lisette's morning coffee that she has at the regular cafe place. While Lisette is having her calm coffee, Sammy is sitting on a bench in the park reading a magazine on the play of a cosmic crime. Here you can see the desert assassination scene featuring in the magazine. This magazine is part of this book. And this whole this instance is a threshold that makes you jump from one scene to another. They decide to go to watch a play on a cosmic crime that took place at the National Theatre School. And after the play, they go to the theatre back entrance staircase, and to their surprise, they see a hole on the staircase. They follow it all the way to the outside of the theater until it just hovers on top of them. At that exact point in time, the hole appears to 100,000 years ago to the early humans in Africa. And in, a, and in, a, and in Italy, on an exhibition of Anish Kapoor and Dissension, and in, in Coyote and the Roadrunner. Lisette and Sammy, in such a shock of the discovery of the hole, decide to turn it into a lab where a search is conducted for its deeper meaning. They realize that there's different forms of black holes to be in search of. Black holes in memory are memories like running water flowing in the river of the lake and falling into a violent ruin of oblivion. Black holes in the web so much information has already been lost inside a digital black hole. And black holes in libraries, considered as undocumented or destroyed knowledge, um, such as the book burning of the Nazis in 1933 that destroyed all the books considered un German. And more specifically, we can find them in archives. I went and had a chat with the archivist 
and buttons. 60% of the AI archive is not catalogued. So much information is not there. And I asked to catalog a project for him. It's a, for, it's a project of a fourth year student in 1949 um, of the National Theatre School. Now, if I don't give him back this book, the project doesn't exist. But it's not until Lisette met with the brilliant professor Jerome Gauntlet in London that she fully understood the reality of the black hole. The black hole is a funnel that sucks everything in until you cross the Schwarzschild radius entering the event horizon. Everything can become a black hole. For example, if you take Earth, crush it to the size of this book, leaving it same math, it, it becomes a black hole. The pull gets stronger until you reach the most conceptual and crucial part, singularity. Gravitational singularity is an infinite small space with an infinite large mass, where gravity and density are infinite, and where the laws of physics as we know them cease to operate. You then disappear to reappear somewhere else in different time, space, and this also allows the coexistence of the same thing to exist in two places at once, such as these books. Um, there are three different types of black holes. Stellar, supermassive, and miniature black holes. Here is the example of a mid-sized black hole that contains the mass of 100,000 suns. Mm, but it's not but the professor explains that uh, the black holes aren't as black as they're painted. Information does escape them. Um, information never dies. It always transforms and regenerates. So, okay, so back to Lizette. After her chat with the professor, she decides to go back to her library and take the books that she previously collected from the assassins of his flat in Egypt. She finds a clue, a perfectly crafted paper Klein model inside one of his books. Now this led her to open up all of the books she didn't previously open that she collected from his place. A book on ziggurat architecture and the first Flat on the first pyramid in Egypt. A book on the Greek mythology of a phoenix, a long-lived bird that cyclically regenerated or reborn. A book on the camera obscura, she flips through it and learns that through a small hole in a small dark space, the camera obscura projects the image of the whole universe. This book falls back into her hand. After having read all of the carefully crafted books, the next morning, Lisette has her regular coffee, and that specific morning, she decides to create her own book, adapting the assassin's carving language, where she can keep track of all the possible narratives that happen to the victim's corpses. Now, these possible narratives are some of the possible narratives that can feature within this book. And this book is not a black hole. It's a fundamental tipping point. That controls time, space, K, and takes you back to the beginning. It's Lizette's morning coffee. Mm -hmm that she has it at the regular coffee place. Oops. Across the shore. While Lisette is having her coffee, she then goes home, has a nice bath, Fumes herself. While she's having a calm and nice bath at that exact point in time in Egypt, a shot is fired and an innocent man dies underneath the full moon. So. <laughs> <coughs> 
So the Z and Semi as being very well reputed detective rush to the crime scene that takes place at the National Theatre School. Here. The case continues where they go to the assassin's flat and try to gather more clues. They enter his library and to search for more books, they collect the books to collect more and more clues. But little do they know, the assassin is always a step ahead. With the help of his accomplice, he completely destroys the corpse's evidences, burying the ashes inside the Banga jungle. Or even transforming some of these ashes into diamonds. These diamonds are then crushed to their Schwarzschild radius, creating a black hole. After five years spent on the case and no other evidence is to be found, Lisette and Sammy start getting sucked into an unsolvable case, where all the clues exist simultaneously everywhere and nowhere, making it impossible to construct a linear trace with our contemporary laws of physics. So they keep looking for clues and then until they reach the point, the singularity point, the point of no return, and all of these books fade back into the archival library. As architects, we have the possibility of complicating our work through the juxtaposition of time, space, scale, and narrative. And this becomes a world generator where all of these exist simultaneously everywhere. Um, so everywhere. And, um, using the black hole as a tool with the only position for all objects to be perceived at all angles. Thank you. So I'm going to be presenting a brief I did uh, about this time last year and first year. Um, and it's looking at designing a lifestyle in the context of Marfa in Texas. So I'm going to begin with the final output of the brief, which is a three and a half minute film. Leaving behind his past life, he's become detached from the reality he used to know and the limitations of the urban environment. Now his days are spent following the tarmac across the open landscape, endeavoring to stop at every place he comes across. Living out of the motel, never spending more than one night before moving onwards, in search of stories and organic experiences, these stories of the luggage he carries with him. He no longer has any physical ties to one particular place. This point-to-point -point travel, taking each new place as it comes, connecting the dots along the road. There's no other coffee that kicks off the Miller's morning like Folger's crystal. It's the best part of the way of giving up. It's more juicy if you want to come.
not say enough good things about Freeman yesterday in our meetings. I looked around and I looked up and I, stood, and I saw this thing gushing up over the, over the dairy. And I told my friend, it's a gusher, so we rushed down back to the, to the location. It was basically the Discovery Well in the South Texas area. It's 7.30 in Houston, time for Colton News. Thanks to the big vote in Houston and Harris County, Texans are going to have liquor by the drink, at least on a local option basis. That's the way it went in the big vote yesterday, although it was not determined until early this morning. News Center 11 is brought to you in part by Texas Commerce Bank. Good evening from the News Center, I'm Fred Rose. The room embarrassed down at police headquarters tonight, the prime suspect. So, that was a film essentially narrating the lifestyle of this character which was invented. So, taking Marfa as the, the site in context, this is Marfa, it's an absolutely tiny little town, just situated in, in Texas, and we were able to decide on a location sort of in and around. So I decided to choose Highway 67, which is this sort of southwesterly road which connects Marfa to essentially uh, the rest of civilization. It's incredibly, incredibly isolated. Um, and took this about 6.7 mile stretch of road to be the site for this character. Um, and so I was incredibly interested in taking, looking at lifestyles which are on the move and people that use cars, especially in America, a society which is obsessed with the vehicle and its sort of dependency on the car in a way and the relationship that people have with their car, um, and then also with the radio inside as a form of communication for information um, as well. And so this is just a site view of the piece of, uh, the stretch of road essentially that I chose to be having as the base for this, this lifestyle. So we began by uh, creating a series of collages that would depict, depict this character. So I was very, very obsessed with this idea of moving along the road to so taking the, the constant of the car um, and of the uh, of like the radios are, and looking at different places that this person could be visiting along the way. So stopping at things like drive-in cinemas and motels, uh, and drive-through restaurants and things like this. And that relationship that you have with these kind of quite vernacular architectures, but then how you can essentially narrate someone who would be making this journey. So the character became to be defined as this, this sort of drifter, I guess, which is a term which could be applied to a few different types of people, I guess, in society as well, but mainly the idea of this, this uh, singular character in this project himself, he's left the city um, and he's decided to take up a life on the road. So he's living essentially from the car and passing between motels and his whole premise is that he's going to just go between all of these different places and sites like restaurants, diners, churches, uh, like campfire kind of cabins as well, and just collect as many stories and experiences as he can. And so these are some early iteration models, just looking at spaces and essentially and looking at forms of what a diner could be, and also how you're sort of designing things in isolation, like if you're gonna take any of these forms um, and pick them out of any site, because where they're situated in, in Marfa, in the desert, there's essentially nothing around them to dictate sort of borders or limitations of space. So looking at the idea of what would happen at night as well then as they sort of light up um, and become these isolated little blips in the darkness because there's obviously no sort of artificial light or street lamps or anything like this out in that, in that landscape. And I was looking a lot at kind of Jack Kerouac um, and looking at the beat generation um, and kind of kids that are on the move and migration as well. And it came down to these kind of three vernaculars that were illustrated in the, in the film. Um, so taking the diner, like this campfire in this motel, and taking them out uh, into quite sort of like 70s kitsch-esque aesthetics um, and looking at them sitting there and what happens when this, this character goes and interacts with each of these spaces. So this is a site plan just looking at how they kind of interact with each other. And so if you imagine this road, which is just completely continuing forever and there's no, uh, 
anything else around it. The, the only sort of drawing points are these little buildings which he's stopping at along this route. And it becomes almost like a commentary as well on the dependency that people have maybe on the radio and this breakup of social interactions. So he's inhabiting the space of the car and then passing into inhabiting these spaces. So he continues along. So this is a mapping drawing just showing these, these vernaculars in the landscape. And then from that, these spaces at the beginning weren't as defined, so I decided to go on further and look at articulating the church, which I was a bit obsessed with, in itself in a bit more entirety. So this church, which is designed, takes the idea of the square to begin with, and this is a section through it, and then just distorts it by introducing this internal corridor, like open air corridor through the middle, and then separating two spaces. So you have this more social leisure aspect of what a church could be, and on the left-hand side, the actual church itself, but making it more multifunctional, so it's not specific to one religion or one group of people, for example. And this sort of social aspect, I guess, of making a pool or a bar, for example, um, because churches themselves are incredibly social places when you think about them. Um, and then this then will become almost like a, a drawing point for people and people in the landscape to travel to. This is just more cuts through it. And then this is a secondary church building which is kind of design taken from the circle and splitting it apart like a fan and cutting it down to different heights and just looking at the axo to take the form and separating it from the rest of the context like in itself yeah that's it yes I wanted to ask you do you read George Louis Borges Yes, uh, he was also very inspired from his work. Absolutely, because yeah. as you were talking, I was running through the Alith and, um, and the circular ruins. The, your circular yeah. story really reminded me of that. Um, actually, I thought the way that you handled it was extremely beautiful. Since we're Thank talking you. about beauty, I thought it was... Um, you kept coming round and round and round and round, and I, that, that is... A circular story and that itself is very it's quite exquisite I, I mean quite apart from the quality of the of your work which I think is fantastic um, I love the fact that you understood a sort of spider's web of things going on and coming back to it back to itself so my congratulations I think it was really interesting I would have liked you to go on for another half now an and tell me a bit more about what happened <laughs> <laughs> thank you Well, I wanted to thank both of you for your projects. They're both really exciting and interesting, and you both gave great presentations, beautiful presentations. Um, I was thinking a little bit about the pairing of you two and how I could kind of draw similarities. Or, um, and one thing that I thought of was um, the two kind of sp maybe spaces, I don't know, the, the black hole and the desert are these, are these kind of kind of scary... Uh, yeah, yeah. How, how, you know, they, they have similarities in the, you know, unknown field as unknown fields, and how from that there's this idea that it kind of generates something about wondering. So, um, before you even mentioned your drifter, I was thinking about wondering through your video, and then even if now you say that it's circular, I, I was completely lost in your presentation in a good way, and I was wondering through it. So. Um, I think for me it was that, that was the kind of beauty, it was the, the wondering that, come, that isn't valued enough, the kind of, the beauty of getting lost. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you. I suppose I should come back on James as well before I hand over. Um, I, I was really intrigued at the point at which you were looking at sort of the nomad in the car and the, the radio being the communication because I think that was really important. I really liked the way that you used that through this film. Um, but actually, what I saw, the common commonalities, were actually Yasmina's time, space, and scale issues, because both projects, in a very, very different way, dealt with those issues. In the middle of a desert, there is no time. You've lost a sense of scale completely. You could see that by your diagrams. I mean, you're placing what we would normally consider to be, I mean, they looked actually quite urban sort of buildings yeah. in the middle of nowhere. I mean, they could have been thousands of miles apart. I had no sense of scale 
It was, it was really interesting. But the idea of somebody sort of traveling up and down, not relating to them, really. I mean, you, you made them relate, but I didn't see the relationship because I just think this person was sort of wandering about. The only thing I wanted to ask you about was your church fascination and, and where that fitted in. Could you just give us a little bit more? I thought it was really interesting, but it sort of felt like it was something you... And by the way, I'm completely bonkers about churches and I wanted to look at this. Yeah, it felt a little bit like that. Bit of an add -on, sorry. It was an add-on. It no, wasn't not, just me then, that's good. Not in terms of an add-on, but it was more like... Um, I guess I just wanted because there's exactly like you were saying, like there's no sort of boundary defined by a desert, so no leave like a black hole. It's just got this kind of complete extensiveness to it. So um, I just wanted to keep adding these these types of buildings, these vernaculars to it, and keep designing like past the stage of the film almost. Well, it would, but, why, but possibly in a way, but like one that'd be incredibly disconnected. They, it wouldn't join into almost like pit stops buildings, buildings if like pit stops. It's always difficult to start adding to what other people say before you, so, but uh, if I am to say anything, so I just thought what a remarkable difference in the way how you approach the subject, you know, so, and I think it's talking about beauty, I, I think that beauty was so different in each project that it really kind of generates uh, much more in the, the idea of what really beauty is and how you grab it and how you express it. And just of talking about the first project, it was like listening to a lecture on quantum physics, you know, so the images come in and just disappear. And to be honest, I could not follow the story because I was so fascinated by beautiful presentation which you put together that I was looking at the craftsmanship, at the ability to express yourself in so many different ways and putting the story together, that the story, I think that I would have to, and would love to, you know, hear it again in order to be able to connect it all. But indeed, as quantum physics, you know, so everybody has got different interpretation. And so my, what I got out of it is this absolutely enormous amount of imagination the way how your creative process, you know, creates those beautiful, not only images, but the things which you actually do through your hands, you know, so, which, you know, the models, are, I mean, it is absolutely amazing what you managed to put together. I don't know, was it a year project or how much time did you put in? A year, yeah. It was a year. You know, it was just absolutely astonishing. And in a way, I just have to ask this question, how much the story was relevant to what you were doing, you know, so how much in, you know, what came out of your hands and your mind and your intellect, you know, how much was actually came first and the story followed or was it vice versa? Because, I mean, I think that if you were doing, I don't know, a church in the desert, would it look similar or would it, you know, because I think in that kind of instinctive approach to what you are doing, which I found really absolutely astonishing, amazing, beautiful, congratulations. So I think that I just saw what came first, you know, and how those two things interrelate, uh, interconnected. And if I go to the, into your presentation, so again, you know, I, it was a trip of BAA in 1973, and we traveled exactly, you know, the same route through the desert. And I could just have imagined, you know, so what you were showing, the car, and that time you can imagine that the car, 1973, the cars actually looked, you know, so, and the interiors of all those motels and the church and the journey and these long distances and nothing happening. And the way how you actually, you know, led into the project which you were going to do. So it, no, it was just amazingly beautiful. And I think that if it is a first year project, so I have to say, you know, so it really is um, quite uh, remarkable what you put together from, from this trip. I don't know how long you spent doing it. And there is also one thing which, um, you know, I would like to say 
and it's always, because having done so much teaching, it's always amazing, you know, how much you develop between the first and the fifth year. And this ability to go deeper and to kind of unbind the story, to find you know, the means, how you express yourself, um, uh, how you, um, you know, create this more and more complex project for yourself, you know, so, and that is what the school and specifically this school does. So I think that I was really so pleased to say because I think that I can see the journey, you know, how it's going to continue and I can't wait to see your last project in five years. <laughs> um, because, you know, so when you finish with the complexity of that church, you know, to me it's always this most difficult thing in architecture is how you actually transfer this, the idea into a reality. And that is what I think in this school just of marriage is actually <coughs> because having said on the external so many times the difference between the third year and the family, you know, it is just amazing. So thank you folks very much. I think that I'm really delighted that I've been asked to sit on the jury. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we could keep get, we could keep going. I'm not going to do more congratulations because you've had lots. They're very, they are really tremendous. Um, and I just I I suppose I had a, the the thing I um, take away from seeing your projects because I don't think it's really a jury. It's more of a fantastic. Well done. You did all this last year, and I'm sort of curious to know what you're doing now. But um, in terms of what your your tools and your exquisite economy of means, I have to say, in terms of materially how you produce that work. Bit of paper, bit of a knife, uh, bits of footage. Um, but, but I think uh, Ava used the word crafted, beautifully crafted and, and put together. And I think that's a tremendous achievement to think about that. But then there's the use of word, which is a very difficult thing in architecture a dangerous thing that it isn't there to to disguise a kind of lack of some other content there but the word kind of connects the pieces together or fills in the part that you can't show and i just think you you worked with the, your tools the, in a very economic way um really effectively um i suppose i have one i do have a question which is sort of a jury question but but this and I think it was asked also before, I'm not sure it was really answered, but this use of character straight away, is that something that is useful immediately in order to construct... No, let me put this another way. I think what was tremendous to try to, try to work with is this infinite space. And how do you start to... Uh, what kind of constraints do you put down to work with infinite space? And I would ask both of you, is that a material? Is that a character? Is it a, is it word? To have, where do you start in order to constrain, give yourself some constraint? You can ask together or individually. <laughs> um, with me, it started with a book, but not the fiction, but just literally the book. And looking at it as, a, as an object, if one if if it operates like a device where one page is one and the other one is zero, mm -hmm. and what's the infinite possibilities you can do if you operate it and you draw the scenes black and white and the characters can be any character and uh, so I think for me I would say it started with the book mm -hmm. and then the story came in mm -hmm. to be able to create all of these infinite narratives. Mm -hmm. I would say pages and, and a knife. <laughs> I guess for me as well, it was the, um, uh, the film, because a film like in itself is, is quite a big constraint in terms of if you're trying to display a desert, there's only so much you can do in sort of a, a short time frame. Especially on film, you've got a certain amount of space that you can show. Um, and as well as that, uh, I guess, designing a lifestyle itself, then through the character, like what the character's doing, the spaces that he interacts with, like I decided to go for quite sort of... Uh, vernacular pieces of architecture which in, in themselves have already like predetermined sizes and sort of boundaries and things um, 
which I guess then helps to define those spaces as opposed to letting it be too vague in that way. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think like another um, maybe point to follow up this question because I was I had a similar a very similar question to think if you focus as well on the not, on, not it's not only a question of beauty but a question of the pleasure of of the design and the pleasure of the what you're trying to create um, how can can you do it without let's say having a starting point so I think you know, in your case the character is the guy that start to almost give you some hints on what the design might look like. In your case, the fact that you started with the book, that it was a like a guideline to then construct this aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important you know, to really think, what does it mean to construct beauty? Or, does it, or what does it mean now to work with aesthetic or with, or with a specific type of pleasure? Um, so maybe like, if, if I look at the church, does the drifter go to that church or not really? Does That's the drifter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, just, do you imagine the drifter in that type of space, or yeah, maybe, yeah? Yeah, everything, yeah. Of course. <laughs> 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 because I think maybe around. because the, the church was a bit the add on, yeah. and the, we just lost the drifter. I mean, the drifter just drive off, you know, yeah, like. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and in your case, like, was, was, do you think the, the idea, because you started from the book, then it guide quite a lot as well the aesthetic of the, the way you communicated your project? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, the format really restrained it in a lot of ways. Um, but also the book was necessary because it's a tool that you can link to, to the universe uh, and knowledge and libraries. So like the smaller scale of the universe and a black hole would be the library and books. So it was also important for Yes, it was a, a balance of aesthetic, but also an importance of the importance of the argument. So I don't think it would have been <coughs> reflected as well in another medium. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how much more I can add, but I was definitely very struck uh, between the two projects. The first one. Um, also being a designer, I think in terms of the multiple scales that you approached in your narrative, it's also something that I feel like I've been drawn into and the story continues um, beyond this presentation and um, I really appreciate you tackling the idea of the infinite number of choices that we have to make, whether it's in life or whether it's as a designer on a project. Um, but at the same time, the very controlled intention that you had behind the way that you told your story um, which is kind of ironic then when you look at the other project which is very linear, but actually quite aimless, and which is also beautiful. But I think that kind of contrast between the intention and um, when there's unlimited number of choices, we can still tell a very intentional story, um, leaving the space as well for uh, the unknown or personal experiences, a variety of perspectives, and then also the beauty of following one very, very uh, specific perspective and taking the time to consider what, what they're perceiving. I mean, I've never actually paid so much attention to the texture of rubble or gravel on the road because it was really just, you know, that's what I saw when you were presenting your story. Um, I think the church is not an add-on, but it's the beginning. Um, I was really struck with the site plan because of, again, the scale of the desert in that line drawing specifically. You don't need the, uh, the satellite map behind it. You really see the kind of, you know, th there's a beauty in the abstraction of this long, endless road and then these tiny little vernacular uh, moments that come up. And then when you go into the church, I just see so much more potential. I'm kind of picking up on what Jane was talking about earlier. It just looked, you know, a little bit split between a regular church and a pool hall. I could see so much more inside that church. That's the moment when this incredible world that you've built up and this incredible background could then offer up another world inside the church where the drifter then is either confronted or his, it changes maybe even the direction that he heads when he comes out of, there's, you also had this like spiraling church or, um, yeah, so good luck. Um, all the best, yeah, as you continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I now call up Gilly for the second of our pairings. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Gilly. Um, I recently finished the MA for History and uh, Critical Thinking here at DAA. And this is a research project that I'm going to show. I'm going to start with a short video. <laughs> Non soltanto da, dalla Giordania, cioè non, non soltanto dividere il Israele dalla Giordania, cioè dividere il nostro viaggio, ma 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 nei paesaggi dei personaggi. I paesaggi sono quattro di qui spelacchiati e i personaggi sono degli ebrei dalle fasi estremamente moderne, che hanno subito in tutto il mondo contemporaneo, dal romanticismo in poi profondamente, ne sono profondamente lacerati e hanno perduto tutti i caratteri, diciamo così, arcaici che devono cercare per i miei figli. E il paesaggio, quello che più mi intriga, è appunto questo paesaggio, questa scelta che Cristo ha fatto di un luogo così terribilmente arido, così terribilmente disadorno, così terribilmente qualsiasi abilità, quattro chili scrivi spelacchiati, il fondo di un lago temporosamente caldo, e non si possono chiedere un altro che So, the clip that you just saw is from a film by Pier Paolo Pasolini, who arrived to Israel in 1963 to find locations for his film The Gospel According to St. Matthew. And what he does is he basically goes around the Bible land or the Holy Land, but he's incredibly disappointed from everything he sees. This is a scene where he goes to the Jordan River and he says that he's embarrassed for aesthetic reasons. Um, and this is very similar. When he sees Nazareth, he says it's absolutely useless. And this is pretty much his reaction to the entire <coughs> land. As me and someone who's coming from there and usually feels similar reaction, um, decided to research into other people who have visited the Holy Land, but were mostly incredibly disappointed. And this is Pasolini, much, much like these people, were immersed in kind of collective memory of images and stories, which was of course far, far from reality. Um, these books kind of were meant to rectify a horrible experience that they had, or a really kind of immersive disenchantment. People who said lines like, uh, it's, it's a hellhole, it's completely dry, it smells like cheese. You know, there's no kind of milk and, and honey in the Holy Land. And someone who made an entire book about this is Mark Twain. And his book is called The Innocence Abroad. And he called it that because he was hoping to rectify other people's experience by making him see with innocent eyes what Palestine actually looked like. So his entire book is telling the reality of the place through his eyes and how it really is kind of, you know, a horrible kind of degraded place that's far from holy. But actually, this relates to our discussion about beauty and what is beautiful and what is holy and what's the Western aesthetics as opposed to what this Oriental colony was really like. Um, and actually, Mark Twain, if you look at the routes that he undertook, they were very similar to the one recommended by Thomas Cook. And Thomas Cook, if you know, was the first man to do organized tours to Israel, to Palestine, to the Holy Land. So essentially, Mark Twain was a, a tourist. He wasn't a pilgrim, he wasn't an explorer. He went on a very prescribed route and that's why he was underwhelmed because he just saw what everybody else saw before him. And Thomas Cook and his tours were kind of sending people to the <coughs> Levant, to the Orient. So it was a Holy Land tour along with Athens and Egypt. So it was kind of the moment when traveling became a commodity and the Holy became something that you can um, sell. Um, I discovered a diary from two women from 1888 that went on one of those uh, cook tours. It was never published, it's the great-grandmother of my housemate, and it was really incredible to say what they saw. And unlike Twain, they weren't so disappointed because they had a guide. They had somebody there to show them the place, to show them the landscape through a very particular lens. And basically, every piece of stone had a meaning. They said, this is the pile where David picked up Goliath, uh, the stone to kill Goliath. This is where Jesus leaned upon. So suddenly, everything came to life through the lens of the person that shows you the way. So this is just one of the stories that this place holds. Um, and I found this book that kind of does the same thing, but without being there. So it was sold as a delightful tour of Palestine without leaving home. And it was a book about two and a half feet wide. 
and it had photographs, but every photograph had a very long caption. And the caption, I say, was like the guide, because it says, for example, well, it was called, sorry, it was called Earthly Footsteps of the Man of Galilee from 1894. And the picture on the left, for example, it says the rock upon which Jesus leaned on. So suddenly, kind of a non-descriptive site becomes completely monumental. And this valley, which Mark Twain probably would have said that it's completely boring and kind of plain, suddenly is the Valley of Vialon, where Joshua commanded the sun and the moon to stand still. So this kind of um, conjunction of images and text is actually what a travelogue is. Um, if you look at the definition of a travelogue, which is a combination of travel and monologues. And I find it very interesting how a textual and an image can together create this representation which creates myth, which then circulates around the world. So these kind of underwhelming sites were solved by giving them kind of mythic um, image, but how do you explain for things like railroads happening in the Holy Land? And people that came and saw this as a railroad from 1892 in Jerusalem were completely shocked by the fact that the Holy Land is infiltrated by this modern kind of intruder. And somebody said that when the moment that he hears somebody says, all aboard for Jerusalem, that would be the end of everything. Because you cannot go on a train to Jerusalem, you need a camel or something like that. And unlike previous people that would write text to kind of rectify what they feel and kind of erase a previous image by a representation, people now had to actually remove the modern obstructions by the practice of biblical archaeology, which was just becoming common. So in this way, they would really unearth or dig down to the truth and find what was beneath the city. Um, and they said this, this is a travelogue which is called Buried Cities Recovered, Explorations in Bible Lands. And actually this guy said that the, the real city of Christ is hidden beneath accumulation of filth of other nations or layers of debris, which is essentially layers of other civilization that built, there's like an Ottoman city upon it, has to be removed to discover um, a fantastic subterranean city which has cisterns and columns, and that's the real city, so we need to start digging to find it. And actually, pilgrims believed in it, and they went to pray at ruins because they seemed as more authentic than anything else. And this became kind of institutionalized, so the Palestinian Exploration Fund, funded here around the corner in 1865, um, um, under the patronage of Queen Victoria, is sent kind of missionaries and explorers and scientists and archaeologists to survey the Holy Land. This is an amazing drawing of the cisterns hidden below Temple Mount by people from the Palestinian Exploration Fund. And it's actually still active today at Pal X Fund. And they have a lecture at the British Museum today. And they're still kind of serving. But then it was really a mission of colonizing. It was early ways of learning the land for colonizing it. There were also sent photographers. This one was taken only 15 years after photography was invented. This is 1854, it was invented in 1839. And the amazing thing about this is that it made Jerusalem look like a place with no people that's just ready to be conquered. But actually, photographic technology only allowed for really long exposures. So no people could be caught on the film. So the medium itself, which seemed then to be kind of the only like objective reality, was actually far from it. And it's just another way to show how representation is actually far from true. So we spoke about the colonizing project. And indeed, in 1917, the British entered uh, Jerusalem. And that's when they began their projects of turning from travelers into kind of locals. And that's when they can really beautify the city. So not just write about it, not just dig deep into the ground and find it, but really change the face of the city. This is General Allenby entering Jerusalem in 1973. And the first thing he did was appoint Sir Ronald Storrs, who was kind of a very romantic, friends of Lawrence of Arabia, kind of a great Englishman. And he appointed his friend, Sir Ashby, who was a William Morris follower and arts and crafts um, activist to run the New Jerusalem Committee. And he appointed Sir Patrick Geddes, the famous Scottish town planner, to design the New Jerusalem. And together what they said is that now in Jerusalem, everything that we associate with our sense of beauty, as in Western ideals, um, the beauty is in danger. Landscape, unities of streets and sites, embodied vision of the men that set the great hall together. All these things have to be considered practically. Now, how do you consider the holiest city in practical reasons? How do you make it beauty? 
So the first thing they did, uh, made a plan. Jerusalem Town Planning Scheme number one from 1920. Essentially, it was a project of two cities. There was the new city, which has to be heavily regulated, and an old city, which has to be saved from the evil of the past and kind of resurrected in an image of a city that never existed, only in their minds. So the first thing about the new city is everything had to be built with Jerusalem stone. So this is stone that's carved from within Jerusalem. Um, and until today, it's still active. This is a picture I took last year. It's the same stone, although I suspect that now it's being imported from China because there is no more room. I mean, there's no more stone underneath the city. But um, everything is 100 years later is still being built by this, in this petrified aesthetics of the Jerusalem stone. The second thing they did is remove all of the ugly things, as they call them. So this beautiful Ottoman clock tower was removed in 1920. Um, and the lastly was the Jerusalem Park. So Patrick Geddes uh, wanted Jerusalem to look like Edinburgh Castle because that was his imagined uh, Jerusalem. So basically the city had to be set in the middle of a park. Um, so following pilgrims will not be disappointed anymore. They would come and they would see a beautiful city surrounded by greenery. So this is the park with the holy city in the middle. And this is kind of, if it wasn't violent until now, this is when it really becomes explicit. So above is the Jaffa Gate reconstruction at present. And then below it says, the same as suggested when the unsightly obstructions that hide the wall line are cleared away. So residential and any other structures around the walls had to be cleared away um, for the sake of beauty of Jerusalem. And actually today, it doesn't look so different. So it's a bit worrying, but I guess that it worked. Um, so my argument is that the city was transformed by travelers turned settlers who made Jerusalem in the image of its representation, designed to be aesthetically pleasing for the future visitors by restoring a biblical city that never existed. So to kind of conclude this thing, we all know what happened next, and this is a topic for our PhD or my PhD, and I will not elaborate on it now. Um, but I did kind of want to undertake one of these travelogues in my own, and as someone who was born in Jerusalem and studied architecture in Jerusalem, I couldn't um, do the same because you know, I know it from a different way. So I went to a place which I've never been before, which is the sites of Christ's baptism on the Jordan River, which is in the buffer zone between Israel and Jordan, so usually you can't enter there. And as I was saying before, you always need a guide. You need someone who knows the place and can really explain to you at least one of the sides of the story. So I was taken there by someone who's the head of the site from the Israeli National Parks Authority, which is a body that really takes care of all the heritage in the country. And his story was really fascinating. Of course, it's a very single-sided story. It's the Israeli authorities' story. But he also has a lot of hopes for this place, which he can never do. And he took me around, and I took the photos. And this is spread from my thesis, which you, you can see here on the table. And essentially, he's just showing me the way he sees this place, which is full of landmines and people baptizing in a very filthy piece of the Jordan River. Um, yeah, and it's really beautiful to see the kind of passion somebody has for a place like this. Yeah, so thank you. That's it. Hello, my name is Zineb, and today I'm going to present my project from last year that I did with Inter 12. So I was a third year student. So I want to start my research question that is, in the context where generating income often clashes with pro-environmental initiatives, how can wilderness and beauty provide a long-term strategy in order to maintain a threatened landscape? So my project is divided into three phases. The first one is understanding today's context, where um, economical globalization and environmental globalization are often in opposite, as one is about generating income and the other one about preserving the environment. So my project consists of finding a balance between these two phenomena that will be about um, uh, generating low income for little maintenance of the site. The second phase is uh, sacrificing part of this wilderness by generating a sacrificing part of this wilderness on, on the landscape in order to attract people, gener uh, generate income and create interest. So my intervention consists of a series of basins on the island in Wallace Island in Essex. So that after, after 50 years, it will create a new understanding of landscape aesthetics in the context of climate change. So here is an idea of how the, of this type of uh, aesthetic and beauty. So 
So my site is Wallace Island. It is located. Oops, my site is Wallace Island. It is located on the east coast of the UK. It's a flat land of four of four kilometers by two and a half. It has been suffering from a lot of flooding because it is two meter below sea level. And today it is used. Uh, it is. Um, it is used by the RSPB that are trying to create this new natural reserve because all of the earth that's been taken from London Crossrail have been brought to this land in order to raise it above ground. But today they still didn't manage to finish all of it. So that's why I'm focusing my intervention on the south part of the landscape. So the island is a series of marshlands, wetlands. It is very vast. It is very empty. And when I went to visit it, it, it was just me and two or three other bird watchers. So it doesn't have a lot of interest to this type of environment and I'm trying to create an appreciation of such of such a landscape. So today there are three types of landscape that are being, cons or that are being considered valuable. So the first one are the um, agricultural lands like the farms because they generate income. The second ones are the culturally beautiful, so the all the curated gardens. And the third one, the environment that contains an important biodiversity like for instance the Amazonian forest because it creates some kind of, of tourism. So the first aspect of my landscape is that I'm only using people as an agent to activate the landscape, but over time, they're not part of the image anymore, though only because the landscape will mainly work with, um, with, its, with the wilderness. A second aspect is that I want to maintain the flatness of the land, which for me is actually a beautiful aspect of this island. So I am doing three types of intervention onto this uh, island. So the first one is inserting uh, w a wooden framework within the land that would fire or excavate those spaces. The second one, adding shallow amount of soil in order to create wind shelters around the different depressions. Or the third one, subtracting material in order to interact with the marine life. All of this came from uh, different from different uh, research and understanding of how the environment of the site works exactly. So mapping, also understanding how water and wind in today's cases are creating spaces by the phenomenon of erosion. Oops, okay. Mapping the element of wind as in, a, in order to understand how it could work in an efficient way for my design onto the site. as well as water because I want because the, the land is mainly soil based and water will be an important agent in order to erode, to erode and to decay the land where there's like a high turbulence on the south part of the landscape. So this is where I will, I will be making all of my cuts. So out of this uh, flat landscape, the only element that will come out will be the garden. So looking at Roberto Berlmarx, who is a landscape architect, his strategy consists of creating a catalog of, guard, a catalog of plants that he knows exactly what kind of um, environment he would create. So I selected uh, 12 plants that, I, that, could, uh, that can grow in such environment because it is poorly drained, it is uh, salty water. So these are the, the plants that could grow in it. And so the garden is contained within the land. And when they are fully grown, so this part here, after 50 years, they will be the only element that would come out of the flat land. And 
And uh, thirdly, because I want to emphasize with the activities of bird watching, I'm proposing this type of uh, bird watching hide. There are three quarters embedded within the ground, and I still have a big opening at the top, so the so the so the activity can still be done during rainy season, especially in this part of the this part of the UK where it's uh, also, it's also it's raining like quite often. And the last type of uh, cut that I'm doing, or the seasonal cut. They are located on the, on the south part of the island and they are 4 to 5 meters deep and they are mainly to interact with the local flora and fauna to create an adapt adaptation process for the time. Here we are in 2015, and agents such as water, wind, and the movement of people will start eroding and decaying the land. So water will start reshaping the, the, the shape of the, of the island, whereas wind will start dispersing seed over the land, creating wild patches of vegetation, whereas all of the excavated spaces, because of filtration of water and pressure of people, will start, will start decaying and fragmenting into smaller pieces. So over season, so over season the land will change slowly from the to the the landscape will start creating this type of really uncomfortable environment, very, the, in the, uh, something that is decaying, that is very wet, very muddy, very cold, so creating this type of beautiful but unconventional, unconventional type of environment that can only be perceived in the third phase as, as, a, as an image from far, so creating this tower in this little town of Burnham and Crouch. So to sum up, my project is looking at how to find a balance between generating income but still proposing environmental, um, environmental initiatives. So, the in the, so generating low income because it still won't attract a lot of people but enough to maintain it because all of the intervention requires, uh, doesn't require main, many, uh, a lot of maintenance because they're all maintained by the external factors. So this is an approach that can be uh, applied to different threatened landscapes, whether they are threatened by climate change, like in this case, or by economical purposes, in order over time to create a certain appreciation, interest over the desolate landscape, so the unconventionally beautiful. I will um, attempt to start again to um Extraordinary projects. The latter I have a little soft spot for because mm -hmm. my unit worked at yeah. Wallasey Island a couple of years ago. So I, it was pre-birds. Really. Well, there were always birds, but it was pre-designed for birds particularly. Um, but I uh, thought that was you captured it well, um, atmospherically. And I, I suppose that there's just I think the thing that is interesting about both um, in terms of just a theme of interest, which is. <laughs> clearly very present and relevant is the idea of um, our wilderness or what we notionally call wilderness uh, being productive in some form and how we continue or as human beings we try to try to draw productivity out of everything we see or put our hands on and the different ways that that you that that we as human beings approach that um, and clearly uh, demonstrated in both projects, which I think is uh, something that perhaps we're, um, we've had a go at a number of times over civilization. We continue to do that, and maybe we're at a moment in time where we're extremely self-conscious about it. And I, I wonder about that. So I, I admire your restraint 
in particular, well, in both different kinds of project. You know, there's a design project and then there's a, there's a construction of a project. So I think in terms of the design, I think fantastically restrained. And, and I think we talked about this yesterday um, in terms of the peer that won the Sterling Prize a couple of days ago. But that idea that you, you, you just, when is there too much architecture? Or is there a little bit of architecture? And what is that little bit of architecture? And I suppose in one question I would have for you is, you know, what is, if, if you had to say what the little bit of architecture is, what is it, do you think? I think in, in my case, for instance, here it was a very challenging uh, project because I always felt like I need to put a wall somewhere to call it architecture. But in a way, I thought architecture could also be at the scale of how this flower would relate to the ground and what kind of effect it would create over time and how would people interact with it. So for me, this was also a scale of architecture that can be called this way and that we could also tackle. And so for me, yeah, that would, that would be at this scale also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a, the similarity of the openness as well on the, of the landscape or, or the territory. You now that is the same thing with the project before that start to construct or give an already uh, a specific type of aesthetic. And, uh, and what is nice of what you were showing that with all the, um, the explorer going and to travel and then every time they almost saw a building or something, a construction, they were disappointed. So there is this, always this constant kind of disappointment of architecture. Oh, you know, like every time that there is this kind of like a vanishing point, especially on the horizontal territory, it's, it's not easy to then start to think, how do you intervene? You know, even going back to the project that you were showing of the, of the city. So, I mean, for me, I always find a fascinating to topic, like how do you actually construct or how do you intervene on this, on, on this type of landscape? Like, do you have a bit of an, uh, maybe an idea or something that may maybe inspire you or do you want to look, look at? I know it's a bit of an open question, just because I'm curious as well on this topic. I think that for me, the issue of landscape was, or even landscape theories, was a very kind of serious thing that I was trying to look into. I didn't put it in the presentation because it's a bit too much, but I think that something which is true what you said, that when people saw architecture, they were disappointed because it was obstructing literally the holy land, like it was obstructing the kind of layers of soil themselves. And in a way, there was this belief among explorers that the landscape is kind of God-made, so that's why it should be like cherished. But actually, we all know that landscape is man-made and it's kind of a Western way of seeing nature. So I think that is, is a very interesting thing, how it was trying to be harnessed into like a holy thing, even like the shrine of the exterior. And actually the obsession with it is what made it so manipulated and so loaded until today. Yeah, and I think in my case, before interacting with the landscape, is I was trying to constrain myself and to define how I can, how, and try to define this beauty that I'm trying to achieve of the desolate landscape. So one would be by maintaining this flatness. So kind of saying that I cannot really do straight walls onto it. So I need to find another way of creating architecture onto this land. And also it was mainly about the materiality and how far can I work with it you know, without, try, without disturbing it too much. So understanding the, into the movement of tide, actually use it in an efficient way for me rather than going against it and to force my design onto it, but actually adapt more to the external factors and what kind of form, texture you would create over time. Um, I don't know if, I mean, I'm kind of curious, maybe it's unfair for me to ask you as well, because it's quite a big question, but how important is truth to your project? I mean, for instance, even in the first one, when you look out at the desolate landscape, these stories about the biblical stories about the significance of this rock or of that view. I mean, how important is it that that story is, act whether that story is true or not, or whether it's fiction, because it still has a result. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very good point, and I think that the reason I started with 19th century travelers, and not before, because I think that's when kind of science and religion started to be together. So it was a period where like the truth of the Bible could still be considered as history, and they were trying to authenticate the Bible in so many different ways. So 
I think that's the moment when kind of pilgrimage failed. That's when pilgrimage became tourism and, and kind of scientifically. So for me, when the kind of quest for truth became an important thing is when it all started, imagination stopped and kind of creativity and even analogical thinking, which was very big in the Middle Ages, kind of stopped. So I think that's a very kind of interesting thing and I think it's when it stopped being kind of really spiritual, when you followed the truth. I think even in the second project, you know, when you start showing this dystopian kind of end result of if, as a warning, I mean, and that's not even necessary of overdeveloping the site. Um, it might not even necessarily end up in that direction, but it has an effect. I think uh, you had an intention behind it. Yeah, I'm trying to maintain. I don't think it's um, kind of like a dystopian image. I think it, this type of environment exists already, but they're not really like the, not not of people would be interested in it or would say today I will go and visit that desolated, fragmented landscape. And so I'm trying to preserve to preserve those and actually make it, uh, in my point, like an aim that I want to achieve. And to show that this environment are, are actually exists today and should be considered also as some kind, something as uh, something beautiful, something that we can appreciate, that we can actually enjoy. Because when I went to the site like the first time, I really thought I was going to have a horrible day. But I actually enjoyed it. It was just an amazing experience just to be alone in this huge land. And it was, some, and it was something that I wasn't expecting at all. And so it was kind of like this, an emotion that I wanted to, to, like to focus on and to have like to, for, like for everyone to have it. Yeah. Well, I think it, I would, can't stop myself from mm, starting with the story about what is architecture or how much architecture is relevant. When I was about, I don't know, early 20s, I did my MA at the Academy of Fine Arts and the professor was, um, I think, the best professor who I ever had. And once when I was doing an architectural project, which was a very mundane school of architecture, so at, in the evening, he just asked me, um, how about the doors? I said, well, what about the doors? And then he even went so far that he said, how about the door handle? And I said, professor, that is not architecture. And he left me with a thought. He said, for the next meeting, come up with three things which don't concern architecture. And I can only make a comment, I'm still looking. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I've been saying this story many times, so apologize if anybody heard it before. Um, on the other hand, you know, now two projects, they deal with, in two different ways, with some kind of looking at the history or at the past, maybe in the landscape project in the, in the past, in case of considering the question, reconstruction, let it go as it is, changing it. And I think that you just did an analytical assessment of the situation. It, um, I have spent a um, long time in Tel Aviv when we were working on a project, and I know um, Jerusalem, and I can share many of uh, um, uh, your observations. On the other hand, I think that we are kind of all brainwashed by the fact you know, that we all, um, since early age at least, in Central Europe and certain parts of the world, we have been listening to the biblical stories and we have got this image of beautiful garden. We have got all the images of, um, and in films and you know, which surround us. And therefore, we have got completely distorted image of the fact of an um, old town um, or rock. And I have to say, you know, that when you look at it and when you try to um, completely um, divide yourself from those images, uh, there is something very, which is very beautiful about that part of the world. And when you travel through the desert, and then you actually, I had a chance of going down to the West Wall and just of looking at the, con for example, looking at the materiality of the old construction, the way how that city grew up with this big you know, valley and which eventually got filled with God knows what. 
and so on. So I think that the fact that you were born there probably is another element that you haven't got the distance to be objective about looking at it. But it is beside the point, I think, and it is, uh, it is really a question what we do with the past, because we are constantly, constantly um, reconstructing the paces which we don't know what they looked like. We are constantly, you know, thinking about uh, um, uh, the ideas, how we change the cities, how we incorporate past, and we have got very little knowledge when it comes to it. Also, you know, those places are done in uh, in the context of the society, of the climate, um, of all those changes which happened which happen between then and now. And I think that, you know, just from a practical point of view, because I've been constantly, constantly, you know, struggling with what you do with reconstructions. And I think that we are so careless, you know, so how we stop ourselves on one hand from touching all those monumental things. On the other hand, not um, or going too far in terms of really changing the fabric and producing completely, you know, idiotic solutions. And I think it, you didn't actually offer any solution, but it was so good to listen to you, and it was so great to see all those images, you know. So how much damage, you know, we have all done and we are still doing <laughs> to all those places. So it is really a nice little warning sign. As far as the landscape is concerned, again, you know, so uh, it is, I don't really need any architecture. I think it's a magnificent idea to look at it. And it is, I don't think it's a solution which you are looking, uh, looking at, but I think that the fact that you are actually thinking about how we could preserve places. I was just leaving this morning, I was listening, how much insect, insect you know, just of, uh, we have managed to, to kill, so practically there is no insect, you know, and which, um, and bacteria, and God knows what we have managed, you know, as, a, as a human beings to, uh, to completely destroy. So I think that all those thoughts, you know, how much successful we might be at the moment, but I think that keeping it in mind and making this kind of background to our architecture, thinking, I think that it's terribly important. So thank you both. Thank you. Great. Um, I, I, I saw some really beautiful things in both of these projects, but completely different, actually. I, I couldn't really connect them. The only connection I could see is the sort of historical and, and, and hidden beauty. And the other one is beauty looking into the future. Um, Gilly, I, I really loved the way that your project brought out the view that actually beauty is in seeing through other people's eyes. I, I thought that was really, really interesting, that if you have an interpreter, it's like looking at a painting. If somebody can talk you through it, you see completely different things and it becomes beautiful to you. Or maybe not, or maybe you hate it. I mean, who knows, but actually, uh, I think the, the bit I, th what I wrote down there was that, you know, you don't need truth to find beauty. Um, what you need is inner passion. And if you have inner passion, then you find beauty. Um, the, the, the beauty I found in yours, Zina, was very different. I like the way that you described the start of this project as trying to find a balance between sort of money and, and conservation. And actually, I think that if you get that right, that's, beautiful, that's pretty beautiful. Um, I loved your presentations. I thought they were absolutely charming. So congratulations for that. Um, but I think there's another sort of potential beauty here, and I think that's even less intervention. I think um, delicacy of intervention in itself in, into nature. I mean, I love the fact that you talked about natural erosion. That, that to me, just is perfect. Um, I don't think we have to go creating stuff, walls. I mean, I did notice you've got these... Um, rooms for people to stay in but I was a little bit worried about them being dug in into a marshland but um, <laughs> the, 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 the idea that you have very little intervention for me apart from just an ability to, to have a look is enough so I, your restraint was pretty beautiful to me well done um, I'd like to thank you both because I learnt so much <laughs> um, it's a real, real like, 
little lesson in, in 10 minutes, I don't know how long it was. Um, I, I had a thought while Gilly was presenting, when you were showing us the three images of the, the men that were involved with the, um, redesigning uh, the kind of urban, urban landscape. Um, one of them was associated with William Morris, which I thought was interesting because uh, I'm glad Ed Bottoms is here because he can correct me. <laughs> but, um, William Morris had a, an agency or an, uh, called the Anti-Scraping Movement, is that what it? Um, and um, it, uh, it was against the removal of monuments that, had, that were being removed because they were being considered inauthentic. Yet at the same time, in a different context, uh, this clock tower was removed because it was inauthentic. So I think that's interesting, the kind of the con how the context plays on you know how we how you know how, what measures are taken. Um, Actually, then um, it wasn't even considered inauthentic, but surprisingly enough, it was too modern for them. Um, so they said it kind of destroys the biblical city. So that's why you need to remove it because. Yeah, it was Ottoman was equal to modern, and it was ugly. That was the word in the Ashby's report, and that's why they removed it. So, I mean, I think that the question of authenticity came a bit later, but I actually didn't know about this um, movement. The movement, so it's interesting. But the, 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 visibly, they were able to appreciate the mm -hmm. layers of something in, say, London, but in this context, maybe not. And I, I was thinking maybe... <laughs> It'd be interesting if you two collaborated, maybe if uh, Zineb was uh, in, in the shoes of these men and how, how delicately she would approach uh, <laughs> the question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you both. My name is Talia. I'm a recent graduate from the Enfield the Cities program here at the AA. Um, I was invited to talk about a small exhibition I initiated and curated last year at the back members' room. It was called Because You Are Gold, and it was essentially a spontaneous reaction to Trump's uh, election in the United States. It was composed of this photo that you see here, um, taken by Sam Warren, and a series of um, materials from the AA archive, kindly donated by Ed Bottoms. Um, and the whole idea behind this exhibition was to analyze Trump's apartment as a base to understanding um, the ideas that stand, that stand behind him. So if this panel is about beauty or the lack of beauty, in this case, you can say, um, by uh, thinking whether it's beautiful or not, it actually covers up um, very important ideas that are that stand behind uh, design decisions that were made in his apartment. Um, and when you look at it in comparison to uh, materials that were made in the 1920s, for example, um, that were um, kind of like an extension of the Beaux-Arts school, uh, in Paris, and back then was even a bit outdated. You can start looking at the different details that were made in this apartment in 1985 um, and find uh, very similar comparisons with 18th century French um, water fountain, for example, or an excessive amount of gold used, said that it's 24 karat uh, gold. Um, and the Palace of Versailles, that is a symbol of uh, Louis XIV um, reign of, uh, of France. And he was known, I mean, this, this palace is kind of like a symbol of his absolute reign in France and taking himself away from the center of Paris and, and, um, and the people that is actually reigning. In a, in a similar way to Trump being at the top of his tower um, in his three-story penthouse covered with gold. Um, so you kind of wonder what are the, what, what's basically Trump's unconscious is trying to tell us, because essentially he was, um, he was um, chosen by his new politics ideas. He presented himself as being the antithesis of Hillary Clinton, which is 
the old establishment. Um, but when you actually analyze his apartment, you understand that he actually sees himself as a king. All of the, the language, the architectural language that he uses in this apartment is first of all European. It's either Italian frescoes or, um, or Corinthian Greek columns covered with marble, European materials, um, royal, um, royal seats. So it kind of makes you wonder, what is he trying to tell us? And this is, uh, this is from the second season of Fargo. I think it kind of said it all. When Mike Milligan says, do you know what's the definition of the word sovereignty? Um, sovereignty is absolute power and authority. Like a king? Exactly, which is who I am. You're a king. It's America, brother. We don't do kings here. Oh, we do, we do. We just call them something else. Um, so in a way, you don't expect your president to have good taste or even a knowledge of design, but you do, uh, you do have the power to analyze and understand him through the decision that he makes, especially when it's as extravagant and conscious as Trump's and comes as such a <coughs> distinction from his words and the words that he uses and what he claims to be. That's it, thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Josh. I'm presenting a project that I completed last year in Diploma IV uh, under the kind of supervision of Anne-Sophie Ronscott and John Palmasino. Uh, the brief of this unit is to kind of investigate the coast of Europe. It's a uh, juridical, cultural, and kind of to topographic boundaries. And maybe to, to reimagine Europe, uh, not as we know it, but as a settlement on a peninsula of Asia. And this sort of reorientation could help us understand its contemporary situation and how far it actually stretches. The project that I want to present today looks at the outpost, uh, which I believe is an architectural archetype which was used to create the two largest nation states on the planet Earth. If we look at the history of the nation state, we can see its residue uh, still existing today through the, the leaders of, the, of these countries. Uh, they still intentionally personify the culture of outposts. Embedding themselves in the wilderness for uh, you know, kind of photo opportunities whenever possible, but also sort of uh, showing uh, underlying capacity of violence, uh, sort of ability to protect a boundary. So what, where did these boundaries come from? And I think the, the outpost actually provides a way of exploring this. In the circumpolar north, there was at least 30 major language groups that existed. And although contemporary Russian and Canadian culture would have you believe that this is a empty wilderness, it was obviously not the case. There would not have been any sort of mercantile imperative to get into the circumpolar north, north if it wasn't occupied already. So if we look at this 300-year uh, um, expansion, what we actually see is the complete um, use of centralized capital in London and in Moscow to fund expedition after expedition through the, the river systems of the circumpolar north until these two kind of uh, centralized political entities ended up on the northern coast of California and aside, essentially called it a draw and decided to, to reinforce each other's supply chains with the kind of produce of northern California. So this is a very long kind of uh, story, but it actually is still playing out today. If we're looking at the contemporary uh, lands that have been given to these people that were already there, uh, the pink is, uh, designates official treaties that have been signed with these nation states. So in Russia, you can see there's actually not treaties signed, but in Canada, there is a few. So to understand the architecture of the outpost, we should go to the main outposts, I think. We should go to York Factory in Canada, which actually sits on the edge of Hudson Bay. The York Fork Factory outpost uh, was the de facto capital of Canada for about 150 years. 
It was rebuilt several times, and it was a permeable architecture where people could come in and out and trade. It was used to extract furs from the, the people that were living in this area and throughout the tributaries of the Hayes River. Although this river system was basically used to access all of the interior of Canada to the west coast of California. Going back, where did this kind of outpost come from? And we can look to the Hanseatic League, specifically to the London Contour. Again, this is an exchange of uh, goods through a kind of permeable architecture existing in the city. It's an urban space. You can almost argue a space of hybrid hybridity. Sorry, what happened there? Okay. <laughs> the expansion into the into the into Siberia was something that you will it has been called the conquest, and this is a this is a painting. Uh, sort of glorifying the, the conquest of Yermak, uh, who was uh, kind of instrumental in setting up the first steps over the Ural Mountains, which led to the expansion of the, of the uh, Russian fur trade. Uh, so unlike the, the sort of Canadian counterparts in, the, in North America, uh, the architecture of the Kremlin was used as an outpost, uh, whereby existing kind of systems of tribute that were under the control of the Khanate were basically used. So in the top left corner, you can see this sort of mercantile quarter uh, whereby the people that were already living there were subjected to kind of come and pay tribute to these, these systems. So it's a very kind of robust, almost let's say militaristic kind of situation. And the entire city is kind of uh, involved in this, even though you could see outside of the walls that there would be something happening. So to sum summarize kind of the mercantile outpost, you had Merchant, who was uh, more or less the, the money behind the, um, the operation, a very unsavorable kind of figure in medieval European culture. The Factor, who was a person that uh, basically ran these particular outposts on behalf of the Merchant. Métis, which is a hybrid person who understood, let's say, the, uh, the language and the topology of the given area where they're extracting and then the actual extractor. And this kind of relationship went backwards and forwards and you could say it's sort of a, an axis of mercantile relationships. So that's a key note to make about the mercantile expansion into these areas and the outpost of the, or the architecture of the outpost is it, it, it relied, let's say, on a system of knowledge exchange that couldn't have been kind of carried out otherwise. There would be no fur trade if it wasn't for people that were acting, let's say, as Métis. Now in the outpost in 2017, and these are everywhere in the circumpolar north, you actually have the missing uh, factor in Métis. So this is sort of an uh, axis of industrial relation where people are displaced uh, according to sort of economic forces into the northern kind of uh, reaches of this country for extraction. Uh, so no longer furs, of course, but now nickel, uh, oil, aluminum, copper, whatever the market really demands, there'll be a camp set up in the middle of nowhere and people will be sent uh, to work or willfully go there. For instance, Norilsk in uh, Siberia, this is a closed city. Nobody is able to access it without permission by the Russian government. It's basically hell on earth, and people, uh, they receive massively high wages to compensate them for the, the ill effects to their health. In Canada, we have uh, Fort Nelson, which is basically a site of massive kind of hydroelectric dams, and they're kind of servicing an oil field um, that's you know, next to Fort McMurray, the second largest tar sands operation in the world. And I've been using these satellite images and showing them as a false infrared. This is Landsat data. And so everything in red is actually green. So it kind of gives you the idea of the, the, uh, the environment that these places are in, are, are willfully kind of explained by nation states as wilderness, but actually nothing could be further from the truth. They're actually using wilderness to mask the extraction. So, and, and then again, you know, in Siberia you have, I could, go on and have a lot more examples of this, but I'll spare you. But the, you could say that these kind of uh, architectures are usually set up uh, by extraction companies, in essence, to kind of uh, get people to go where they would never go normally, and so they could extract. And so how do we save the outpost? What is the contemporary outpost? Is there something that we could do maybe to sort of decentralize the power of the outpost and break the supply chain? So I think we have to actually go back to the mercantile uh, era again and insert the idea of studium generale. So this is like the medieval university, which were, were 
incredibly interesting places because they sort of existed in spite of the, the nation states that they were kind of in or city states and that there was actually groups of students and, and teachers that would have to negotiate uh, the terms of their uh, you know political existence let's let's put it so these were kind of the first outposts of itinerant human beings uh, in in Western Europe and they still exist today so for instance you know we still have Paris Oxford Bologna in in orange you're actually seeing the the the, the structures that are still used as university buildings and so the project is kind of in a sense just using research to kind of show again how how we could actually look at the outpost as a kind of a natural uh, archetype to, to actually bring back uh, the, this notion of studium generale. So this is coming from a, a, a French uh, priest who was at the, the Paris University. He's describing uh, the students who would come, so uh, from England to, to come to Paris to become university students. So no wild landscapes, no steep crags or valley gorges, no road filled with dangers or harassed by bandits was enough to keep them uh, from hastening to thee. Throngs of young Englishmen would not be frightened by the ocean blocking them with its storms and waves, with, with its contempt for all these dangers. They have streamed to thee as soon as hearing thy name spoken. Now this is the occupation of Alcatraz uh, by the American Indian movement in the 1960s. The model. Sorry, the 1960s. Of our island. And what was proposed here was to set up a university. Uh, university on Alcatraz Island, probably one of the most oppressive kind of colonial uh, sites you could imagine. But what was actually proposed here was a reaction to the, the colonization the of petrol companies and the black right, what we're saying Alcatraz And so this movement actually comes and says, we'll use the, the university as a place for itinerant young people to come and to focus this sort of political fight. So I think this is an interesting case of uh, how natural how natural the, the outpost could act as a, as a university. So this is a point cloud I constructed of Alcatraz. Um, and then more, in a more contemporary time, we could see the, the, the water defenders uh, at Standing Rock as, as another kind of a form of a studium generale, a place where it was actually an inclusive outpost that included people in to actually uh, critique and to challenge the, the idea of uh, sovereignty of the, these extractive companies. So now wh where, do, where are we left now if we, if we think about this? And we can kind of look to the circumpolar north now as the site of data extraction in a different sense. So this could be a beneficial way going forward. If you're looking at these red dots on the map, I'm sorry, it's not super clear, but these are actually sites where uh, universities are, are tracking uh, climate change and they're tracking all different kinds of information in order to understand specifically how uh, the atmosphere is heating up, how the environment is changing. And it actually turns out that people who are, are nomadic, itinerant sort of uh, people that are in these areas provide the most uh, kind of subtle and uh, useful data. So in a sense, what I'm proposing is this uh, and why I made this thing here. Is, is it's, it's meant to be an artifact of the research because in a sense what I'm not trying to do is propose a certain uh, formal university but maybe to suggest that specifically uh, the forms of extraction do not necessarily uh, f make us uh, give up the idea of outpost in this territory but perhaps we could reimagine what the outpost could be in light of the university. Thank you. We have this conversation earlier in the year about uh, beauty as revolution and Jane was speaking very much about appropriateness because um, we were trying to talk around what how do you how do we define what's uh, what's beautiful what's not oftentimes it's also in the eye of the beholder and so this morning I kind of probably someone can correct me but uh, really quickly on Wikipedia if you look up beauty in um, Koine Greek which is not like classical Greek uh, there's a, the word for it actually means of its time. And so I thought that that was um, very much related to the project that you presented. And I think, you know, so in that word in Greek, someone who is young but trying to look old or someone who is old but trying to look young is also not really, it's not the essence of the meaning of that word. And also it could relate to a fruit maybe that's ripe. And, um, yeah, so I think for me that explains a lot also about why it's 
so ostentatious when we see all of that gold and all of these um, things that are beautiful when they were first created, but have now been taken completely out of their context. Um, exactly for the same reason, it's a bit unnecessary to, to try and define whether it's beautiful or not, because it's a temporary kind of, of idea. It, it has, sorry. In a way, it, it doesn't matter if his apartment is beautiful or not, because it's temporary. Um, that's why it's better to kind of analyze it to its specific language that it's trying to, to use, rather than saying whether it's good taste or bad taste, whether we like it or not, because, I mean, that's, what, that's how I see it, and I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, you have this, and the, func the function of it is completely, it's not even just an extra layer, it's an extra 10 layers in terms yeah. of not doing what it's not being structural or not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, yes, thank you so much for that presentation about the outposts. I'm still, I think I'm still gonna be thinking about it while everyone else makes the comment, but it's quite fascinating. You, I didn't finish reading that text when, you, when they were talking about how it's also to protect the students mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the thing about the, the medieval university was that it was actually sort of a political structure set up by students and teachers in spite of whatever state what they occupied. And I think that's what's like sort of fundamental was the, the degree of responsibility and, and what it meant and how important it was that people were willing to sort of risk their lives even to get into, let's say, a pretty marginal situation just for that knowledge exchange and how important that was for regenerating kind of European society. You know, it's, it's quite fast. Yeah, the extent and the importance of doing that, I think, especially now in the, um, the importance of uh, being able to make that possible for education. Um, and do you see that as kind of a, an alternative or um, how do you, what is the potential of this? Well, I think it's like, um, yeah, as, as people that are participating, let's say in a Brexit transition, at our institution, I think that we need to look really deeply at what an institution is and, and how it could be uh, organized in a way that it's not cowing to source or some sort of national agenda which we think is horrific and damaging in some ways. And, and that is actually the idea of a, a, a university being an international place of knowledge exchange that exists in spite of a national agenda is what it's always been, or like at least how I've understood it. And so I think this is like a very important thing Like for me, another, another point that I find important in the, in the presentation, especially, I'm, I'm not going to make a comparison, but I think they're very different, uh, not only projects, but also things you were looking at and how you were addressing a topic. Um, what I think is very important on what you were showing is that the visual communication is essential to make a statement. Because sometimes I think, you know, like we are talking about just about the beauty or aesthetic and <coughs> The, you know, even when you describe, let's say, the space of the university by showing those, those representations, those representations are also essential for everybody to almost go for it. So there is a level of persuasion on the visual that is very, very important. I think as architects, we should not forget about that. So I really appreciate the presentation. I really appreciate this object, you know, that, so the, the fact that it's that is here and we see it is really kind of make as well this kind of, uh, um, yeah, it is a, is, a, is, a, is a visual persuasion, which I think is essential. And, um, and in your point, I think like uh, what, I've, what I think is for me, what I find it interesting, it's not too much about the, um, the use of, uh, let's say, uh, gold or the use of, uh, or if it's, or which kind of adjective we could give to this type of speciality, but I think it's more the fact that there is a specific style and that the style is uh, present. You know, like anything for me, like the fact that there are this kind of possible different style that we can embrace or not embrace or discuss, I think is, uh, I think is good. And so I really appreciate that also you set up this kind of uh, almost exhibition in, uh, in the school by showing it, you know, like, so I think uh, I really, I'm really kind of sort of thank you for both of you for, uh, for this kind of two takes on the, on the visual.
Um, I, I, I can only try and say that in a different way, but I, I mean, that's, exa that's exactly what struck me about it and the importance of, well, I suppose I was trying to think, you know, how are architects useful, which I quite think of quite often. Um, and, and I think they're really, really useful at being able to show and, and well, question the way we look at something, uh, continue to re-question the way we look at something and, and then re-show it and continually uh, explore new ways of showing it. And that's, that just can never be exhausted, actually. I just think it will take different forms and I just think it's quite interesting uh, that there's this moment where um, we can look at uh, multiple scales and relate them immediately, um, know they belong to the same thing, and that's partly because of your exquisite ability to construct that argument, um, which is unbelievably persuasive. I don't really, I, I think in both cases, it doesn't matter whether I, I've now translated, I don't mind whether I believe it or not believe it, or I agree or disagree, I am prepared to see the world through your eyes. And that's, um, it's a very, very powerful thing to be able to do and not to misuse it, I suppose, is the, is the real <laughs> trick. Um, not that I'm suggesting you, you would at all, but I think it is, it is a very powerful thing to be able to do um, and to make those connections. So I would, I would just, I'd just encourage you to, to do it more and also to present it to people who are not like us who will just say, we think you're wonderful. Um, and, and actually to really be brave and present it to people who might not get it straight away. Um, I know particularly in the context of, of your unit, Josh, that you're talking to politicians and um, all sorts of different disciplines and, and coming at the same sorts of questions in quite different ways. So I, I, I think it's very, very important that you stay at that table of people. Um, and bring that question again. Okay. Um, I yeah. I to follow from what Samantha was saying. I think you've highlighted things and you've opened my. I, the, the last few presentations were really eye-opening, um, and I, I've had this kind of. As the afternoon's gone on, I've, I don't know if it's just me simplifying things, but I feel like in the first two presentations there was something about delight and wonder, and you know, I was you know kind of excited. And the second part was about something a bit more fragile, and now I'm just super worried. And uh, <laughs> and actually, I feel like I can see how beauty can be all these different things. I it can when it tips into excess, it's something really concerning. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I, thank you for giving me that kind of outlook. <laughs> I, I find these quite difficult to talk about. What we're actually looking at here is politics in visual form. Um, Talia, I thought it was a really interesting topic to have picked because you can apply that, your same way of thinking, to many, many different instances. But I mean, th there's no question with the Trump Tower, it's just, you know, money means power, so take a look at this, mate. You know, it's, that, that, that's, that's basically, it's a statement, isn't it? And we all know what it is, but it's quite interesting that you've now taken that statement and torn it into pieces and then put it back together again and we can actually see what it is. I think Hillary Clinton ought to see that. Um, it's really interesting. Josh, I think yours is almost too much to take in. Um, the, on, the, on, the only thing I think is really, is really nice is this sort of historical connection and then you can see what's happening and the, and the, the hidden politics behind what's, what's being seen here. But perhaps there is some hope. I don't see any hope of, out of Trump Tower, I'd have to tell you. Um, but I, I like the idea that you can do you can do more by using outposts for, for good, but I have to say there's one uh, there's one bit of knowledge which I, I was very worried about, which is the um, uh, the First Nations in Canada, which I know a bit about, yeah. um, who are forgotten, struggling, not helped, suicidal, um, have very poor environments. So what we need to do is to link the great linking up of, of climate change um, 
hopefulness, if you like, with actually doing good for people again and their environments. So that would be, for me, that would make it come full circle if you could actually do good things. I like the idea of students taking over the world yeah. and wanting to do good stuff. So, the, so from that perspective, I really like it, but I think we've got to deal with current situations as well as hidden situations, and there's lots of hidden politics in that. Um, I found it quite disturbing, actually. I'm going to be thinking about that for a bit. Thank you. Try to be short, because I think that everybody is getting tired, but absolutely fascinating, both presentations. And I just have, I'm just going to add what you said about Trump, that he is not going to be permanent, that it's a temporary um, situation. Um, his Trump Tower, his apartment is going to disappear, so he doesn't worry you. Well, it is what he actually wants to achieve and what he is after, like all the dictators and kings and everybody else, they are about the permanence and about you know, gold being a symbol of permanent, everlasting material of everlasting quality. And this is why it's associated with deity and, and, and eternal life. So I think that all those dictators, whether it's Kaushesku or whoever it is, or Louis XIII, 14, they always wanted to copy it permanent. So when um, I think at Columbus and or whenever and then they explored America, so they used material just of purely as a functional material because it lasts, it doesn't corrode and so on. And here I think that it's transferred again into this absolutely ridiculous, you know, sign of power, sign of uh, money, sign of uh, I can afford it. The difference between you know, what you were showing, uh, using, I don't know, um, Renaissance, Baroque in the historic and time, it was done and used by the artists. So there uh, is that beauty, which Trump completely, totally you know, kind of misunderstands because he hasn't got this mental intellectual power to um, appreciate what he's doing. So he's just surrounding himself with material. And, you know, there is something about the dream of those people because I, you know, working with sometimes very rich people, it is always interesting to see how they, you know, want to introduce the dream which somehow is associated with their um, youth and uh, the, the aim in their life that somebody, some, somehow, when they achieve what they think, they made it in life, so suddenly they just don't have to achieve what the dream was. So I think that my first client, when we did the first flat for him, he came to me and he said to me he wanted the bathroom in Palato marble. And I could not understand where it comes from, because he came from Casablanca. He, they uh, lived in a very small flat somewhere in the middle of the city, and his school friend lived in a rich building when they have a bathroom in Palato Marble. So in the same way, you know, Trump who wants to introduce the dream of his life, you know, so the permanence, the richness, the money, so he just has to surround regardless, you know, whether it's the quality with this absolutely silly material. But then I think that going on to in, uh, and the second project, I think that there was this mm, juxtaposition, which I think it, in a way, I think it connects those two stories. Um, the power of um, uh, the education, power of um, the people, scientists, people, uh, the power of the schools, power of education, and um, the picture which you showed is the church and people are actually thinking inside the church and they are looking out at those outposts. And the question, uh, I mean, uh, your uh, um, example of Alcantara is the other way around, n n taking this intellectual power, bringing it outside and looking in. And I found that idea, you know, really fascinating because I think in the distance of being able to actually see what is happening and putting it, you know, somewhere in a complete isolation and looking from the outside in, as opposed to looking from the inside out and struggling in that little period, I mean, across the river or all the other images of people fighting for the territory. So, in a way, it is two stories 
which really <coughs> just to really go to the same point, how terribly dangerous it is to fall in for the power of money, power of gold, and use something which is a pretty basic, useful, functional material which doesn't corrode, you know, so just to, to hold the other people in impression. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I actually had one thing I wanted to add that I saw as a parallel between your projects, which was um, the idea of context. Um, and I think it worked in the kind of opposite ways in each. So you found that photograph. And then I really loved that when you staged it as an exhibition, you kind of unpacked all the context of all the objects in that room and the significance of them, and then how when brought together, they create a different type of composition. And then for you, Josh, I mean, I selected your project because I saw that object on the wall at the end of last year, and I would always wanted to know more about what it was about. And I actually think maybe if you'd flipped your presentation, so you started with the object and used that to kind of tell us a very complicated story of all the forces economic, political, and kind of got this global scale that led you to create that object. Um, I think that would have been fascinating as well because I think that's such a, it's such a weird and wonderful thing in a way. Um, but I thought for both of you that helped me answer kind of what Samantha's question was, which is what, what is the role of the architect? And it's sometimes in that very complicated world to, to, to use your knowledge and ability to draw these disparate things together and give them meaning and I felt like both projects are trying to take on really complex situations and help us understand the context they sit within so I, that's why I really enjoyed both of the presentations. Um, anyway we're coming to the close of this session but I wanted to get all of the presenters up at the front of the room in case anyone in the audience <laughs> had any questions for you. Maybe one down. <laughs> Just hide around the corner. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about any of the presentations or comments? Maybe if you walk down the table, <laughs> again, it might provoke a question. I don't know if this is relevant. Um, but I, I didn't study here and I wondered how, it's amazing to see sort of um, a select view throughout the school and I wondered as a school how do you share information between the years and are there opportunities to pair up or to work together or um, yeah, how do, you, how do you share that within the sort of scale of the architectural education here? Sorry, it's a bit of a weird question. Uh, does anybody want it? I guess it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's almost like word of mouth in a way as well. Um, and it, it's quite almost like a physical process of like passing between different units around the school um, and, and like walking between and just asking questions. Because it's this very like open environment, quite social. And then like the bar especially as well, and those kind of like shared environments. Um, it's, yeah, it's purely a case of sort of seeing someone work or something and just going, oh, like, like what are you working on and just like asking and asking questions and being kind of inquisitive all the time um, and that does very much come back further your knowledge and education as well because then you might get references or different artists as well like, um, go back on so yeah so <coughs> Well, um, I also just want to thank all of you for presenting, and I guess I wanted to ask you a final question, because obviously I made you all frame your projects in the context of beauty, and, um, uh, and I picked them, I think in response to your question, like having just seen them in passing over the past year, and being intrigued by how they were framed or what ideas fed into them, and I was just curious, I think some of you, it was a factor when you were working on the project, but um, with others, I was wondering, like, what was the experience like to, to have to think of it through that lens? Easy. 
Is that difficult? I mean, is it easy just to repackage a project? Give it, give it a title, and then you can, oh, I'll make, it, I'll make the beauty version. <laughs> or I'll make the... I think so. You can... Yeah. Oh. That's a skill. <laughs> But did you have any? I'm sorry. I guess for me it was less about <coughs> reframing it, but it was more about when I thought of it on this angle. I, I thought of the themes as like elegant, fundamental topics that are quite like beautiful. And I think that's how, it, that's how it framed it. I would say I saw it through an elegant point of view that I didn't see before. For me, it was about aesthetics a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So then, from the aesthetics to, to beauty, because yeah. Yeah. no, I just said that for me, a lot of this project was about aesthetics and kind of different conception of what is what is aesthetic to different kind of, and how representation can then transfer this and transmit this idea um, and create reality. So from aesthetic um, aspirations to beauty, it was um, a leap, which was quite natural. So. You probably wouldn't be able to fit it into everything. But it worked. For me, to be, on, to be honest, it was more of an ugliness. I mean, I wanted it to be as ugly as possible, especially because also I didn't have any budget to put on this exhibition. So I basically tried, instead of painting the, wall gold, painting the walls in gold, I'd rather to use a foil that costs one pound and actually makes it even uglier than it was to begin with. And I think it just suited it perfectly also in terms of whether it's beautiful or not, or ugly or not, or whether it does even matter if it is. Uh, I think uh, in my case for my project, beauty was actually the aim of the project. It was trying to find a way to redefine it. So I didn't really have to uh, reshape it or anything because it was actually the the topic and it was the like the conclusion of what I was trying to, to do during my third year project. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much to all six of you and to our six jurors for um, taking the time and also taking on the challenge of trying to understand a year's worth of work in a 10 minute presentation, which isn't always easy. And um, yeah, just I, I, I think open juries are a terrific format that the AA uses to generate conversation and create links across different parts of the school and very different projects. And I think part of today was to show how many different ways you can view beauty in so many different projects. I mean, there's like, I guess 600 and, 90 other ones in the rest in this building so um this is just a snapshot but thank you all thank you, thank you.